I'm going to move this. Joe, you don't need this, right? This is over here. Uh, that's dangerous. <clears throat> Have you guys ever gotten into a situation that at first glance it looked like one thing and then you actually got into it and it turned out to be something else and you ended up in over your heads? Anybody in any kind of situation like that? Probably a lot, right? It's probably a lot of, of situations that we've gone through that are similar to that. Uh, for me, I guess the biggest example is parenting. How about that? Parents, is that a little more than you thought when you bit it off in the first place? Um, and not, honestly, not even me parenting, but my wife becoming a mom. I think that threw me off. I remember, I may have told you this story. I, just, I walked in the door one day from work. And there's Courtney on the couch, and she's just wiped out laying there. And she's got one girl draped on this side of her and the other girl draped on this side of her. And I just looked at her and said, Honey, this is not what I had in mind when I asked you out. <laughs> and she said, Well, what did you expect to happen? And I was like, I don't know. You smell good. I like to be around you. <laughs> you know, I didn't think it through. But, you know, a lot of times there's just stuff. That, that you get into, and then it turns out to be something else entirely. And I'll be honest, I think Christianity is like that. For those of you who've been Christians a while, did it turn out, was there a lot more to it than maybe you thought at first blush? I mean, there, there's more to it. I, I'll be honest, when I was a kid growing up in church, I kind of thought, here's what Christianity is. Okay, God loves you, Jesus died for you, I got that stuff. Uh, and here's what you do. I, I, I remember, I think I got what I received out of it. Salvation and belonging and hope and, and heaven. I, I got that. But what I didn't get was what I had to put into it. What it required of me. Or, uh, because I thought, here's all it required of you. Show up to church, building with other people a certain number of times a week. And worship the right way. And do that the rest of your life until the day you die. And that's it. That's all God wants from you. Show up to a building, sing, do things right. And that's all God requires. Did anybody else kind of grow up thinking that? I'll be honest, that's, that's dangerous thinking. Not only is it very, very wrong, but it's dangerous. Because first of all, it puts way too much focus on you and who you are and what you do. And not so much on God but it also can stunt your growth. If you live your life for decades thinking that's all God wants from you, then you're going to be stagnant and stale. Because the truth is, God expects a whole lot more than that. Romans 12, 1 through 2. We're, we're just going to look at verse 1 right now. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. What does it take? What does God require? What do you have to give? The answer is everything. You offer your body as a living sacrifice, meaning you don't live for you anymore. And it's not just about uh, the gathering, although it is about the gathering and the things we do in the gathering. It's every bit of who you are. The, the image there he uses is sacrifice. And here's, here's a picture of an altar, maybe similar to a Jewish altar, what they would use. If you look at it, it has those four kind of protrusions on the corners. Those were called horns. And what they would do is take the sacrifice and tie it down. They'd, they'd tie the ropes around those projections and then tie it to the animal. And then they would kill that animal. That animal would be dead. And depending on the sacrifice, they would do different things with it. Uh, for a burnt offering, the whole thing would just be burnt. Burnt up to God. Smoked, fumed up to God. For other uh, sacrifices, maybe it would be a little different. Maybe they would keep parts of it and the priests would eat part of it and burn the rest. Uh, but in every case, by the time the sacrifice was over, there was nothing left of it. You did not go to sacrifice an animal and then a couple days later go back and ask for your animal back. Because there was nothing left. And that's what Paul is saying. Christians, 
You offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Everything. You're dead to yourself. You're dead to the world. You don't call the shots. You don't make the decisions. Everything is given over to God. Everything you have and everything you are is given over to God. And that's not an arbitrary thing, guys. It has to work that way. We make a lot of mistakes when we try to work it another way. God always requires every bit of who you are, every part of you, dead to self and alive to God. Turn to Mark 10. Jesus has an encounter with a, a young man, and it kind of illustrates the point here. Mark 10, 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I've kept since I was a boy. Hey, look at this man. This guy has a lot of things going in the right direction. Number one, he wants the right thing. He, he wants eternal life. I mean, he is wise to want that. He's got the right desire in his heart. And, and a lot of times, that's half the battle. If you can want the right thing, it'll make you pursue the right thing until you pay the right price to claim the right thing. So he's going the right direction. He wants the right thing. Not only does he want the right thing, he's coming to the right source. He's coming to Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah. I mean, if you're going to ask anybody about eternal life, he's, Jesus is the one to go to. Notice he didn't go to his, his rabbis. He didn't just go ask his mom and dad. He goes to the right source. So he's got the right desire. He goes to the right place. He's even asking the right question. What do I do? What, how do I lay claim to this? How do I grab hold of it? Jesus points him towards the commandments. He points him towards the covenant of Moses. And the kid said, I've done all that. I've done that stuff. I've lived that life. I've walked that path. So you can tell he's a, what we would call a good person as far as he's doing godly things in a godly way, right? But Jesus notices something. Look at verse 21. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. See, this, this young man, he was willing to, God, to give to God his obedience in certain matters. He, he was willing to honor his father and mother, and he was willing not to be a false witness. He was willing to go a certain distance. But there was a point where he drew a line. And he said, God, I'll give you my behavior up to this point, but I can't give up my money. He was rich. It was too much for him to give up in his mind, and he wouldn't do it. And he, went, he walked away from Jesus. Now, I used to think, and maybe to a certain extent this is true, that Jesus just isolated that one thing in his life, and he picked it out, and said, he knew this is what the kid was holding back, the man was holding back, and Jesus asked for that. And he, he doesn't ask that of every one of us. But that's not true. He does ask that of every one of us. Your money is not yours. And for that man, it was a barrier to him following Jesus. And if he didn't follow Jesus, then he had no salvation. That thing he wanted, eternal life was beyond his grasp, and he was never going to get it because he would not give up that one thing. He had a line he would draw. He was not a living sacrifice. I'll do, go this far, God, and no farther. Folks, it doesn't work that way. There are no lines. We follow God wherever he guides. We obey him in whatever he commands, no matter what the cost. Why? Because we don't live for ourselves anymore. We're living sacrifices. We're dead to what we want and what we think. Everything we have, everything we are is given up to God. 
And if he wants to take something out of our lives, that's his business, not ours. If he wants to put something in our lives, that's his business, not ours. Our business is trusting and obeying, following him on that path. That's, that's what our job is, is to do, not to weigh in the balance whether we'll follow him or not. We, we just, whatever God wants, that's what we want. There was a farmer, this is a preacher story, so it's a total lie, but I'm going to tell it anyway. There was a farmer who had a crop of corn, and hail came and destroyed the entire crop. So he replanted. Corn grew up. Another storm came through, killed his entire crop. He was talking to a friend of his who thought he should just be devastated. And the farmer said, well, it's not my business. God's land, God's corn, God's storm. He can do with it whatever he wants. Do you live that way? Is your house God's house or is it your house? Are you using it for his glory or for yours? Are you using it for his uh, service or for yours? Is your bank account, the money that you have, is that your money or is it his money? If you're a living sacrifice, that's his money, no question. That's his house, no question. His car, no question. His kids, parents, if you have kids, guess what? You're just in a stewardship mode, and your whole job is to return those kids back to him. Your wife, your husband, you don't, you don't treat them the way you want to treat them. You don't, you don't approach them the way you want to. You're a living sacrifice, dead to you, alive to Christ. Therefore, that marriage is God's marriage. Everything you have, everything you are. Paul goes on to say in Romans 12 there, uh, that, let me turn back myself. It changes who you are when you do this. You offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Not unholy anymore, but holy. Not repugnant to God, not wallowing in sin, not indulging all that, but pleasing to God. You change during this process. When you stop living for you and start living for him, and it becomes not just a weekly thing, but a daily thing and an hour-by-hour -hour thing, it changes who you are and how God sees you. You become something holy and pleasing to him. And it happens by the transformation of your thoughts. Even your thoughts become the province of God. The things you dwell on, the things you think about, uh, the, the things that possess your thoughts during the day, you start giving that over to God bit by bit by bit. And you're not thinking about so much, what, what am I going to do this weekend? Or, man, I need to go shopping. And you start thinking, you know what, God, what does God want me to do? And you start noticing things you never noticed before. And you start pursuing things you never pursued before and going places you never went before. As, as you walk with God, as you are a living sacrifice, it changes who you are, and you become transformed. You become less and less like the pattern of the world around you, and you become less and less selfish and less and less prideful, and he's transforming you to be like his son. That process starts here. You start replacing your thoughts with God's thoughts. Maybe you start spending more time in scripture. Maybe you start memorizing uh, passages from the Bible, but one way or another, you start absorbing his thoughts and thinking his thoughts, and it changes who you are. And Jesus Christ looms bigger in your life than any other circumstance or situation that you, go, you have going on. And when Jesus becomes the focal point of your life, man, that puts aside your fears and your doubts and your worries. It puts them in the proper place. Because you're walking with God. You're not living for you. But it all comes back to the altar. None of that happens. None of that happens. The holiness, the pleasing to God, the transformation, none of that happens as long as you are still living for you. And it just doesn't work. Have you ever felt frustrated in your Christian life? Or stagnant? 
Or have you ever felt like, I'm not getting out of this what I should? Or I, why don't I have the joy that I feel like I should have? Or why don't I have the peace that I feel I should have? Well, you don't have those things because you're still living for you. You're not, you're not offering your body as a living sacrifice. You're still doing things your way. Maybe you're doing things 90% his way and 10% your way. That's not how it works. Absolute surrender is the only way this is designed and set up to work. And as long as you are holding on to doing things your way, you're going to be frustrated. Uh, there's a story at the end of World War II. Two ships met in the Pacific, one American and one Japanese, because the Japanese were going to surrender. They, they were done with fighting, they were done with war. The two uh, atomic bombs helped a lot, I think, in that. But they were going to surrender. And the Japanese general stepped forward to shake the American general's hand. And the American general stepped back and put his hands behind his back and said, First, sir, your sword. The Japanese general was still wearing his katana. And as long as he was holding a weapon of war, then it wasn't true surrender. So the Japanese general surrendered his sword, and then the surrender was accepted. Listen, as long as you are holding onto the sword of your own will, you're not going to have peace between you and God. As long as you're still insisting on your way, it just doesn't work. You have to give everything up. And I'll be honest, that's not easy, is it? That's not easy at all. You see, what I thought when I was a kid about just showing up and gathering with the church a few times a week and, and doing the things right in church and living for him till I die, that's a lot less effort than giving to God everything. It's hard. In fact, it may be the hardest struggle of your life to lay down the sword of your will and fully surrender to God. Here is the motivation that Paul gives to do it. Go back to Romans 12.1. He starts it by saying these words. In view of God's mercy. In view of God's mercy. What he's saying is, Christian, step back, take a look at God's mercy. And tally it up. Step back and look at God's, I think start with global mercy. What mercies has God shown us just as, as humans, just as people walking the earth? What mercies has he shown you that he sh gives to everybody? The life that he grants you. The chance at life itself. And then you can start getting personal with it. You can start looking at people that God has put in your life who've been a blessing to you. Maybe it's mom or dad or grandparents or cousins or brothers and sisters. Just go down the list. Mercy after mercy after mercy. Look at the circumstances where God has come through for you. Tally that up. Like, I, I would, I'm not going to do it because it would take too long. But if I could tally up every time God came through for me in my entire life. First of all, I can't even remember them, Right? Maybe he wasn't even aware of a lot of them. But if we add it all up where God came through and God came through and God came through, add up those mercies. Eventually, when you start adding up all the grace and mercy God has shown you in your life, it's going to lead you to the cross. And what God did for you on the cross, giving up his own son to save you, a sinner, Humbling. So in view of God's mercy, start looking at your life through the lens of God's mercy and add it up. Tally them one by one by one. Weigh them in the balance and make the call. Because the truth is, folks, too many of us are sitting on the fence. We like what God gives us Maybe we're not totally willing to give him back what he desires. We enjoy the benefits and the blessings, but we're not quite sure if we want to really want to offer our bodies as living sacrifice. So we hold back. 
What I'm saying to you this morning is get off that fence. Look at your life. Add up the mercies of God and see if it is worth it for you to completely surrender yourself to God. Paul urged them to do that. I'm going to urge you this morning to do that and decide whether you're in or out. My suggestion to you is in. In case you were doubting which way I was coming down on this, it's in. Get in and get all the way in. This is a quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer from his book, The Cost of Discipleship. If you haven't read it, you definitely need to. Here's what he says. The cross is laid on every Christian. The first Christ suffering which every man must experience is the call to abandon the attachments of this world. It is that dying of the old man which is the result of this encounter with Christ. As we embark upon discipleship, we surrender ourselves to Christ in union with his death. We give over our lives to death. Thus it begins. The cross is not the terrible end to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life, but it meets us at the beginning of our communion with Christ. When Christ calls a man, listen, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. I don't know where you are in that journey. Maybe you've already made that call. And it's a, it's a continuous call, honestly. It's a, it's a daily decision. Take up your cross and follow him. It's a daily decision to be a living sacrifice. But this week, I want you to struggle with that a little bit. Struggle with if you've really given your life to him or not. Struggle with the amount of mercies that he's shown you and whether it's worth surrendering to him fully. Maybe you haven't made that call in the first place. Maybe you've held Jesus Christ far from you. Maybe you haven't accepted the salvation at all. Maybe you haven't even accepted the good things, much less the price you have to pay as you walk with him. And if you want to do that this morning, now's the time. Please come forward while we stand and sing.